You ready? Let's go. Let's put our pricing caps on because today you're going to play the role of pricing skeptic. So let's start with uh, today's, let me throw a few puzzles at you because it's going to build to what we're going to do today. So let's say I compute the PE ratios for Latin American countries. I do it for Brazil, Peru, Venezuela, Chile. And then I tell you, you know what, Venezuela looks really cheap right now. It's trading at a low multiple of earnings. What am I missing there? Come on, this is an easy one. It looks cheap, but why does it look cheap? It's crazy, in incredibly risky, you know, interest rates are through at 5,000. So in a sense, there is a reason. You know. So today we're going to talk about comparing PE ratios across countries and ways in which you can control for those differences, because otherwise you can see with storytelling you can do whatever you wanted to do. Let's keep building. Let's say the current PE for the S&P 500 is about 20. It's actually not that far from it. It's much higher than it's been in the last three, four, five decades. So I play the role of a market strategist or Robert Schiller, whichever role you want to take on. Right? And I say, you know what? Stocks are overvalued because the PE ratio today is higher. But the question I have is a more fundamental one. So PE ratios are higher, so there's no contesting that. That's, that's true. But which of the following reasons could also explain PE ratios being higher? The risk-free rate is at a historic low. Could that explain some of this? Low risk-free rates. So we're going to try to make that connection. Could it be that the equity risk premium today is higher than it's been historically? What does a higher equity risk premium do? It pushes down stock price. It's cutting in the wrong direction. If we're lower than it's been historically, then maybe, but higher now. Okay? The return in equity has increased over the last couple of years. Could that help? What does higher return equity allow you to do? Deliver the same growth with less reinvestment. That's good. So maybe higher return equity. So A could be true. C could be true. Maybe expected earnings growth is likely to be higher now than it was historically. Yeah, could be. Do you see where I'm going? If you go back to fundamentals, you can't just look at a PE ratio today and compare to his history without controlling for differences. Today again, one of the things we're going to do is look at the PE ratio for the S&P 500 and once and for all, face up to those people who believe it's a bubble and say, is it really a bubble? Can we explain it using fundamentals? So I'm going to give you a very simple statistical mechanism for controlling. And finally, let's talk about two companies. Company A has a PE ratio of 20 and an expected growth rate of 10% a year for the next five years. Company B has a PE ratio of 10 and an expected growth rate of 5% a year for the next five years. This is, today we're going to talk about this notion of a PEG ratio. PEG ratio is somewhat, some equity research analysts use, which is to divide the PE ratio by the growth rate. Okay? So I'm going to make three statements. The first is company B is cheaper, it has a lower PE ratio. What am I missing when I say that? It has a lower PE ratio, but it also has lower growth. Company A is cheaper because of higher expected growth. What I'm missing is a higher PE ratio. Maybe because I'm dividing PE by growth. Maybe the third statement could be true if I'm a believer in PEG ratios. You see the advantage of PEG ratios is at least in theory it looks like they adjust for growth by dividing by the PE by the growth. Today I'm going to talk about PEG ratios and talk about their pluses. One of the pluses is you can compare companies with different growth rates and also some of their minuses. So let's pick up where we left off our, the, the packet, where I was looking at that hypothetical company. Remember the company where no, I had a PE ratio of 20%, a PE ratio of 28.75, and then I said, what if you get an earnings surprise? So let me, because I did this towards the very end of the class, let me go back and recap what I found. When interest rates are low, your PE ratios are much more sensitive to changes in the growth rate. As interest rates get higher, your PE ratio gets less sensitive. Why? Because the value of growth is in the future, and the higher interest rates become, the lower the value component from growth becomes. And what that effectively means is earnings surprises in a market like this one, where interest rates are low, are going to have a much bigger effect on stock prices and PE ratios than earnings reports 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So the reason we do these very hypothetical companies, you can actually draw some very interesting conclusions about what you should see in the market. Let's try a different one. I used a beta 1 when I did that pe the PE ratio of 28.75. I said, what if the beta were high? What if this were a riskier company? No surprises here. 
holding all else constant, as I increase risk, the P ratio goes down. So for any given growth rate, the higher the risk of a company, the lower the P ratio. But let's make this again an interesting case study. Let's assume that I'm the CEO of a high growth, high risk company. Let me actually be explicit. My beta is two and my growth rate is 20%. So right now, I'm at this very end of the distribution. I'm trading at a PE ratio of about seven and a half or eight, and I don't like it. I want my PE ratio to be higher. And I'm thinking of two different strategies I can adopt, and they're mutually exclusive. So if I pick one, I can't pick the other. The first is to go for more growth. In which case, where am I stuck on this graph? Well, my beta stays at two, I'm going to be in that last component and I can go for more growth or I can go for less risk. In which case, I'm moving across. What do you think is going to have that bigger payoff? Going for less risk or more growth, at least in this graph? Less risk. It's less risk. It's stating the obvious, but it's something that you see growth companies forgetting. If you ever worked at a growth company or worked with a growth company, you know what they get focused on? Growth. More growth. Still more growth. They'll go for that extra 0.1% growth because higher growth is better than lower growth. And sometimes you've got to take their head and move it away from the growth and say, guys, you're being punished for being risky. If you can figure out a way to lower your risk, even if it means less growth, you will get a higher price and a higher value. <coughs> so we're going to take that ammunition we've developed. Because at this point in time, if I asked you what drives PE, let, let's go through what are the three things that drive PE? First, it's your risk through your cost of equity. The second is your growth rate. And the third is your efficiency of growth trans captured either in a payout ratio or return equity. Okay? So you can relax now because I'm going to play the role of a really naive and stupid analyst. I'm going to put out all these recommendations and I want you to shoot me down because you have the ammunition to shoot me down. So here's my first one. This is a very easy one. I'm an analyst who compares P-E ratios across countries and makes recommendations as to where portfolio managers should invest. So this is March of 2014. Russia has just wandered into Ukraine by accident. And I come to you and say, you know what? You should put all your money in Russian stocks because the P-E ratio of Russian, Russian stocks had a P-E ratio of 3.5. This looks incredibly cheap. You're paying 20 times earnings in the US. Why go pay? Shoot me down. So I'm telling you to buy Russian stocks at a P ratio of 3.5. Tell me what I should be watching out for. Huge amounts of risk, right? Not to mention the corporate governance and all the other issues under the surface. There's an obvious reason why Russian stocks look cheap. Russian stocks have been among the cheapest stocks by region for the last, I don't know, 10 years, 12 years. And they're not going to get out of that basement in the near future. Venezuelan stocks will give them a good run for the money, but that's not a contest you want to be running and winning, right? I beat Venezuela, okay, you know. That's like saying, you know, I can run faster than that 500 pound, the woman on the 600 pound, uh, whatever that show is. I watch it religiously. It's kind of <laughs> obsessive to watch, you know. But, you know, you, know, you beat a 600 pound red in a 100 meter race, so congratulations, but that's not much of a race. So I got fired because I sent out this bad recommendation. I landed on my feet. I'm now the emerging market analyst, and it's June of 2000. So I've learned that you should be looking at beyond the PE. So I present you the PE ratios for these emerging markets. And you can see they range from a low of 12 to a high of 25. And I've collected information on interest rates, real growth, and a measure of country risk. That measure of country risk, the higher the number, the riskier the country. So in this group, for instance, Singapore is the least risky country and the riskiest country is Indonesia. I don't know what to do with the data, but I give you all the data. Now, if I just look at just the PE ratio, what's the cheapest market in my group? It looks like Turkey, right, at 12 times earnings. But before you tell me to buy it, you, no, I've learned my lesson. I said, but, but interest rates are high and growth is low. And he says, so what should I do next? And I'm kind of stuck. Because, and now you can see the problem with storytelling, right? I say, okay, Turkish stocks look cheap. Oh, by the way, they have low growth and interest rates are really high. Is there a way I can go past the storytelling? What's the variable I'm trying to explain? Differences in PE ratios across countries. What are the three variables I'm worried about? The level of interest rates, what growth there is in the country, and how risky the country is. There was a reason you took that statistics class, I hope. I know it was required, you had no choice. 
But there is something you get out of that class. Remember the chapter on multiple regressions that you've completely forgotten? What's the objective in a multiple regression? You have a dependent variable you're trying to explain, which in this case is P-E ratio, and you have three independent variables that you think affect the P-E ratio. So help me out on reading this regression. You don't even have to do the regression anymore. Excel does it for you. It runs a regression. I want you to read the regression with me. First, there is an intercept of 16.16. What does that tell me? It tells me something about the level of stock prices around the world. If stock across the world are being pushed up, it's the base from which you. So if markets are all high, that, so basically, that's your starting point. Minus 7.94 times interest rate. So first, tell me what the sign on, the interest, uh, on that interest rate thing is telling me, and then tell me how I'd use it. What does it tell me? If interest rates are high in your country, your P-E ratio is going to be lower. OK, that makes sense. High interest rates, low P-E ratios. Let's take the next one. Plus 154.4 times real growth in GDP. Okay, so if you have higher real growth, you have higher P. Again, makes sense. And finally, the riskier the country, the higher the risk in a country, the lower your P-E ratio. Each of the coefficients makes intuitive sense. Don't get too used to it. Because when you run these regressions, sometimes the coefficients will not make sense. Which, in which case, what should you do? Don't change the signs. I should be a minus, it looks like an you know, or it should be a plus. I got a minus, I just draw a line through, that problem goes away. The data is the data. When you do pricing, what have you done? You've turned your power over to the market. And once you do that, you've lost all power to say it should be something, it is what it is. In this case, it happens that the regression actually gives you coefficients that makes. What does the R squared tell me? How close my prediction is, how much confidence I have in my prediction, 73. Don't get, it's, it's a high R squared, but the reason I have to be honest is because I have a small sample and a couple of countries can give, so I'm not too dazzled by the heart. It's not like I have a sample of 500 countries. That would be that impressive, but 25 countries, I'll take it for what it is. Now, what can I, what, why did I run this regression? Because I thought Turkey looked cheap, but I was concerned, right? Is there a way now you can tell me whether Turkey is really cheap? What am I going to do with this regression? Go back to the previous page, take the 25% growth rate, the two per, uh, no, interest rate, 2% growth rate and 35, plug it into the regression, you'll get a predicted P-E ratio for Turkey. You get actually 13.35. Okay, help me out now. I've got an actual P-E ratio of 12. And controlling for the low growth, high interest rates, and whatever country risk measure, I'm coming up with a predicted P of 13.35. First, is this regression telling me Turkey is undervalued or overvalued? It's undervalued. By how much? You take the percentage difference between 12 and 13.35, which is about 10%. If I believe this regression, Turkey is undervalued by 10%. And if I do that for the rest of the countries, you see I have a country, asset alloc country allocation mechanism. I can tell you, because not all the countries can be undervalued. For every undervalued country, they're going to be overvalued countries. And if I truly believe this regression, I'm going to shift my money towards the undervalued countries. And if I can go long short, if I'm a hedge fund, I'll buy the undervalued countries and sell short on the overvalued countries and then do what? Hope and pray that they move to the regression line. And if that doesn't happen, I could go bankrupt. But I am trusting the regression line to be that relationship. So it's a tool, but it's a very powerful tool because it cuts past the storytelling. I did not do the tool, so they fired me from this job as well. But I'm used to getting a, uh, another job. So now I'm a market strategist. This doesn't require very many skills. It just requires saying nothing in a lot of words. I'm really good at that. So let's say I'm a good market strategist. So now I'm looking, I'm looking at US stocks. It's January 2017. I have three different P-E ratios of computer over time. Why three? Because it makes me look like I know what I'm doing. Here are the three measures of P. The first is standard P, price divided by earnings. But that's so simplistic. Anybody can do it. So here's what I do to show how, how much more sophisticated I am. I divide price by average earnings over the last 10 years. And I tell you a story about earnings getting normalized. That's called normalized P. And then I get even more sophisticated. Say, but earnings 10 years ago, there's been inflation since. Uh, I'll inflation adjust the earnings. And when I do that, I end up with this inflation adjusted normalized earnings it's called the Schiller P. But before all the, you do too much of the finessing, do you think the three seem to move together? They look like pretty much the same line. 
all this finessing did absolutely nothing. So what I'm saying is you get this quasi-sophisticated you know, twisting of the P ratio, not much is changing. In fact, in January 2017, the P ratio was about 21, the normalized P was 25, and the CAPE or the Schiller P was 23.91. They were all much higher than they've been historically. So I put my market strategist hat on. I come in front of you and say, you know what? Stocks today are, so I'm playing, this is my bubbler hat on. Okay? Stocks today are in a bubble. They're overvalued. Why? Because the P-E ratio today <clears throat> is higher than it's been historically. Even that statement is a little tricky, right? It depends on what I define by history. If I go back to, in fact, <clears throat> the Schiller norm, you know what they compare it to, right? The Schiller norm says 15 to 16. They go back to 1871. 1871 through now, the P, the normalized inflation adjust P is about 15 to 16. Why go back to 1870? It makes you even more sophisticated. You can go back that far in time. But let me ask you a question. Let's, uh, let's concede that. Let's, just, let's accept the fact that the P-E ratio today is higher than it's been historically. I'll give it to you. Can I jump to the next conclusion that stocks are overvalued? Or ask me the questions you would need to ask me before you make that conclusion. What's the so think in terms of the fundamentals, because it's going to give you the answer. What are the three fundamentals? Cost of equity, growth, and return equity. So I'll start. What's the first question you're asking, Milton? What are interest rates today relative to they, what they've been historically? And you know what my answer to that is going to be, right? 2017, T-bond rates were down to 2.5%. Historically, they were 4, 5, 6%. Already, you have an opening as to why I can't just compare P-E ratios across time. Let's keep going. Second question you're going to ask me is, what is growth in earnings going forward? At the start of 2017, it was 8.5%. Historically, it was about 6%. There's your second nail in your bubbling coffin. It's the third question you're going to ask me. What's my return equity? It's 17.16% at the start of 2017. It was about 15% over the previous 10 years. My return equity is higher. What does that mean? It doesn't mean stocks are undervalued, but I definitely can't jump to the conclusion that stocks are overvalued. It's incredibly sloppy. And even if you have a Nobel Prize, you don't get the license to be sloppy and say stocks are in a bubble, P-E ratio today is higher than it's been historically. So I need to control for those differences, right? So there's a simple mechanism I'm going to use to show you how much P-E ratios over time have been affected by interest rates. Have you heard of an earnings yield? It sounds fancy, but if you invert the price-earnings ratio, earnings to buy a price, you have what's called an earnings yield. Here's what I did. I graphed out the earnings yield. So the purple line up on top is the earnings yield. The green line right next to it that seems to mirror the purple line is the T-bond rate. Do you think the two move together? It looks like every time T-bond rates are up, earnings to price ratios are up, T-bond rates are low. So there's your interest rate problem, right, showing up as earnings. Remember, that's the inverse of the price earnings ratio. You think, what's the third purple line? The line at the bottom. That's a difference between the T-bond rate and the T-bond rate. What am I measuring with that? I'm actually measuring the slope of your yield curve, right? So when that number is positive, I have an upward sloping yield curve. Short-term rates are much lower than long-term rates. When that number is zero, I have a flat yield curve. And that number is negative, I have an inverted yield curve. You think, who cares? If you've been reading the Wall Street Journal for the last seven or eight months, this is one of those trauma... You know, so you see that, like five different days in the last... What's a traumatic event that drives in, that market strategy is crazy? What, what happens? The, the yield curve is inverted. People say, oh my God. And what's an inverted yield curve supposed to forecast? Predicts a recession. So I put the third one in there. I say, oh, does it really predict a recession? Does it? Because what you're saying, why should that affect P-E ratios? What does a recession mean? Lower real growth. Lower real growth translates into lower P-E ratios. Now, is there a relationship? Again, it's let the data answer. Why are we, if we're doing the pricing, why the heck do we jump in with all this fundamental stuff? It's all about the data, right? So here's what I did. I pulled out my multiple regression toolbox again. What am I trying to explain? Changes in the earnings to price ratio over time using the level of T-bond rates. And I also want to know, does the slope of the yield curve matter by taking the difference between the T-bond rate and the T-bond rate? So let's start. That intercept of 0.0376 gives me my starting point. It tells me very little, but if it's nothing else, that's where I'm going to start from. 
As T bond rates rise, for every 1% increase in T bond rates, what happens to earnings to price ratios? They go up by 0.53%. I know it's intuitively tough to do, but remember, earnings to price ratios go up by 0.53. That's a drop in your PE of roughly 2 to 3. So here's the way. If somebody asked you in an interview, if T bond rates next year are 1% higher than they are today, what will the PE ratio look like? Dazzle them. Right? There's an easy way to do it, right? Take the 1%, put it in, it's a 0.53%. That'll mean PE ratios a year from now are going to be about 2 to 3 lower than they are today. If it's 21 today, they'll be 18 a year from now, if you trust history. What's that number in brackets below the 0.5375? 6.22? That's my T-statistic. It just says, look, not only is there a relationship, but it's statistically strong. It is absolutely true that higher interest rates and lower PE ratios go together. Then I took this yield curve dance and said, okay. I keep hearing from the experts on CNBC that when the yield curve is flatter or negative, it's bad. So I threw that in. And if they are right, what should I expect to see as a coefficient? A negative coefficient or a positive coefficient? Remember, uh, the more upward sloping, it's supposed to be better for stocks. Higher growth and flatter and downward sloping is supposed to be worse. So I'd expect to see a negative coefficient. And the good news is, for those people who are telling the story, is I did. But the bad news is the T-statistic is zero, close to zero. And here's, there's a story that's, that's, that should be told about this. I've been running these, these, this particular regression now for 20-something years. When I first started, the T-statistic on the yield curve measure was about 2.1. It was statistically significant. It kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And then post-2008, it just collapsed. So let's dig a little deeper. What is the story behind, because by itself, who cares whether the yield curve is flat or, nobody says, oh, should I build a factory? Let's look at the yield curve first. What is the linkage between the yield curve and economic growth? Can you tell me, what, what, what do you think the intuition is? Why inverted yield curves supposedly predict recessions? Yeah, but you can't wish things on you, right? So what's the reason they, they expect low growth? I'll give you a clue. Think about what causes yield curves to invert, right? You have short-term rates and long-term rates. There are two ways yield curves can invert. One is short-term rates can collapse. The other is long-term rates can shoot through the roof. Which do you think has been the mechanism by which yield curves have inverted, at least in the US? Long, it's actually short-term rates essentially shooting up quickly. And historically, what's caused short-term rates to shoot up quickly? This is the Fed effect. Because the only portion of the, the yield curve that the Fed has any impact on is the really short end. And historically, when the Fed gets panicked and it wants to cut back on money supply, thinks inflation is picking up, what does it do? It hits the brakes, short-term rates shoot up. And to the extent that the Fed is seeing things in the economy that are bad, investors have historically jumped and said, oh my God, the Fed is panicking. That must mean bad things are coming. Therefore, we're going to lower stock prices and lower growth. So what's happened since, I mean, 98, obviously that was working, right? What's happened since 2008 especially that's led to investors not seeming to have as much faith in this measure? Well, they've lost faith in the Fed. The, this is the reality. There was a Fed effect in 98. There's no, in fact, you all through the 20th century, the Fed had an effect on the U.S. economy. But remember how I described the Fed when we were talking about interest rates, like the Wizard of Oz. The power of the Fed comes from the perception that it has power. And to the extent that that perception fades, people say, well, you know what, the Fed can't make real growth go up or down. It's exactly what's happened in Japan. For 20 years now, the Japanese central bank has been trying to bring economic growth back by cutting rates and cutting rates and cutting rates. They hit zero. They didn't seem to notice. They kept cutting rates. It's like somebody driving a four, you know, you know a, a, a clutch car, you know, first, second gear, third gear, fourth gear. You're still not going for it. You go for the fifth gear. There's no fifth gear. The gear shift is out in your hand. You keep sixth gear, seventh gear, eighth gear. At some point, you're, you're not going any faster. Your car's going to break down any moment. The Fed effect is weakened because we've seen that the Fed doesn't have the power. It's a very dangerous time because, I mean, as investors, we want we need the Fed to actually have it. Because what does it do? It gives us that escape hatch, right? When things are really bad, we can then look to the Fed. 
we don't have that luxury anymore. Because we don't, if you don't trust the Fed, what's the point of looking to the Fed? So what you're seeing here is a weakening of the Fed effect. But all of this discussion was started by what? Are stocks overvalued today, right? So here's my task for you, and I'm not going to do it in class. I want you to try this on your own. Go look up the T-bond rate today. Go look up the T-bond rate today. Plug it into that regression, now the top regression. Do you see what that's going to give you? If you plug in today's T-bond rate and T-bond rate there, you're going to get a predicted earnings to price ratio today. Let's say, and for, um, I don't know what the exact, let's say you come up with 5% as your predicted earnings to price ratio. If you trust that earnings to price ratio, what should the P-E ratio be today? It'll be the inverse, 1 over 0 0.05, which is 20. Then you look at the actual P-E ratio. If it's 18, what's your conclusion? Stocks are actually undervalued, not overvalued, given where rates are today. So try it out, because it's the easiest mechanism for taking apart this entire argument. So our P-E ratio is high, therefore, because it's, in, as I said, an incredibly sloppy and lazy argument. So now let's talk about this ratio that I showed you, which is a peg ratio. So one of the things analysts have always struggled with, if you pick stocks based just on P-E ratio, you're never going to be able to buy high growth stocks, even if they're undervalued. Because let's face it, the higher your growth rate, the higher the P-E ratio. So for decades now, people have looked for a way out. In the 1970s, Peter Lynch became a legend because he ran a mutual fund that at that time was a fairly unusual mutual fund, and he made it go from a really small fund to a really big fund. You know which fund he ran? He ran Fidelity Magellan, one of the very first growth funds in the market. And he did, <coughs> and he did it really well. So he delivered 20% returns a year. In the process, he became an investing legend. He retired actually very young. And he wrote a book on how we approach picking growth stocks. Because at that time, everybody was reading you know, Benjamin Graham, and there's nothing in Benjamin Graham that will allow it. And he said, what I look at is I look at the rate of change in the PE and the rate of change in the growth rate. What I'm looking for are companies where the growth rate is going faster than the PE. So he brought in this notion, you can't just look at the PE ratio, you've got to look at the growth rate. He didn't actually come up with the PEG ratio, but analysts soon after said, hey, why don't we just divide the PE ratio by the growth rate? Because if you have a high growth rate and a high PE, then it might be okay to buy you. So the PEG ratio <coughs> was created by dividing price earnings by the growth rate, and the original objective was we can take growth out of the picture, because now we can compare low growth to high growth stocks using the PEG ratio. But let's step back. If Growth rates truly become our go out of the picture. If I do an intrinsic, remember how I did that intrinsic value equation for a P ratio? If I do that for a PEG ratio, then if growth rates are truly being taken out, growth should no longer show up in the equation. So I took my original P ratio equation and I divided both sides of the equation by the PEG ratio and ended up with an equation for the PEG ratio. It looks incredibly complicated, but what was my objective? I wanted to make growth go away, right? Has it gone away? It's actually all over the place now. It's in the numerator, in the denominator, it's a positive, it's a negative. It's become this incredibly messy relationship. And here's why that's scary. With P and growth, at least we know which direction the relationship. Higher growth, holding all its constant, higher P. With peg ratio, if they ask me, as the growth rate increases, should the peg ratio change? I'm going to say, yes, it should. And you ask me in which direction, I'm going to say, I have no idea. That's a horribly bad place to be if you're trying to use a ratio. I think peg ratios should be banned. I think there should be, nobody should be allowed to use them because the people using them don't even know the dangers they're exposing themselves to. So here's what I'm going to do. With peg ratios, I'm going to argue you're not going to run away from the fundamentals, but the relationship just got a lot messier. The variable on which I have an easier time is risk. On risk, I know exactly what should happen peg ratios. It should go down. Riskier companies should have lower peg ratios. That's the easy part. But with growth, the relationship is incredibly messy. It could go up or down depending on where you are in the growth spectrum. You think that's a very you know, arbitrary statement. So here's what I did. I went back to my original. Remember that 20% growth stock for which I computed 28.75 PE ratio? I decided to compute a PEG ratio for that stock. So again, it's a very simplistic example, but it's going to allow me to keep everything else constant and change one variable at a time. And with those variables, a 25% growth rate, I get a PEG ratio of 1.15. If this company can expect to grow at 25%, I would expect the PEG ratio for this company to be 
That's my base. But again, the nice thing about this now is I can change one thing at a time. So what do I want to see? What will happen to the peg ratio's risk changes? So that's the first thing I looked at. And the relationship is nice and clean. As the risk goes up, the peg ratio decreases. So the next time you see an equity research report where an analyst is saying, this stock is cheap, it has a really low peg ratio. What's the first question you need to ask? Is this stock riskier than the rest of the market? Is it riskier than the rest of the sector? Because the answer is yes. He hasn't proved a thing. The peg ratio should be low. And then I change the growth rate. And then I also change the return on equity. And there again, the relationship is nice. As the return on equity goes up, which is the same thing as the retention ratio, the peg ratio is higher. So, so far, we have two of the variables nailed down. We want, if, you have a, if you're picking based on peg ratios, we don't want high risk because that'll kill you. We don't want terrible returns on equity. That'll kill you. And then I said, okay, this is nice. I'm creating a set of things that I can look for. I looked at what had happened to the peg ratio as the growth changed. And now you can see the problem. Initially, as growth goes up, the peg ratio decreases. But at some point in time, it goes the other way. And I couldn't tell you which direction unless I knew where your stock was relative to the average growth stock. So if you have a really low growth stock, increasing the growth rate will actually lower your peg ratio. If you have a really high growth stock, increasing your peg ratio could actually increase the peg. Now you see why it's so difficult to pick stocks based on peg ratios. Because what I get out of pricing are screens. So when I look at PE ratios and I want to find cheap stocks in the market, help me out. I want low PE ratios. So I take them with a cap IQ and I look for low. You can actually do this. So take a cap IQ. It'll take you two minutes to screen for stocks. You want low PE ratios. You're saying, how low is low? Try 10. If you get only two stocks, try 12, right? This is pricing. So with 10, let's say you get 750 stocks. So you found 750 stocks with low PE ratios. Next screen, you look for growth. And remember, Cap IQ, they have expected growth rates for the next few years. You say, I want stocks with high growth or low growth? High growth. So basically, find me stocks with a growth rate greater than 500%. Nothing will come through. Then try 50. Then try 20. And 15, maybe 55 stocks. Now you've got stocks, low PE, high growth. What's your third screen? Risk. You want low risk? So find me, you can use, remember, we're no longer in intrinsic value world. If you don't like betas, throw them away. If you want standard deviation, they have all kinds of other risk measures. You know, I want companies which are low risk. And again, try different numbers because you want it. And you find 23 stocks, low PE, high growth, low risk. You run one final screen. What's the final screen? What kind of return on equity? I want companies with 25% plus return on equity. Maybe five will come through. You think only five? How much money do you guys have? Five is a lot of stocks to buy. Those stocks have met all your screens. With peg ratios, do you see the problem you're going to run into? You want stocks with low peg, obviously. You want stocks with low risk or high risk? Low risk, so you better maybe have low standard deviation, low beta. Okay. You want low return equity or high return equity? High return equity. So, so far, we're worse. Just moving along really well. Then I ask you, low growth or high growth? Now we're screwed, right? We don't, we don't, yeah. No, I don't know. And that's, I think, the reason I don't like peg ratios. Because you're doing pricing, you want to be able to make that. If you can't make that statement, you're in real trouble. So the next time you see a peg ratio report, take it through the test. You'll be amazed at how much stuff is hidden under the surface. So here are my basic propositions about peg ratios. You would expect high-risk companies to trade at lower peg ratios than low-risk companies. And the intuition is very simple. For any given growth rate, the higher the risk, the lower the PE ratio. You would expect companies that, earn, that deliver growth more efficiently by having a higher return equity to trade at higher peg ratios than companies that have to work harder to deliver the growth. But with, on the growth rate, maybe companies, because companies with really low or really high growth rates tend to have high peg ratios, and companies in the middle have low peg ratios, if you're screening, you probably want to get extreme growth rates, right? So you want to say, find me companies with either really, really low growth rates or really, really high growth rates. So you'd have to look at the average growth rate across companies. And I want to avoid that. Maybe a standard deviation, a deviation of the growth from the average, an absolute number. And say, I want companies which have growth rates very different from the average. But it's a much trickier screen to run. And I'm not kidding, take Capital IQ, you have access to that data. It's an incredibly rich database. It's easy to run the screens, right? There's a screening right there too, so you don't even look very far. Click the screening, 
and then you can screen by geography, by p so basically you can run as many screens and you can go crazy on what you call risk and how, what, what screens you want to throw in. Any questions on peg ratios? No? Let's talk about price to book ratios. This is a legendary multiple, right? It's every value investor staple. If you're raised on Ben Graham and you've listened to Warren Buffett long enough, this is the ratio you're supposed to use. And the sales pitch is very simple. If a stock trades at less than book value, it must be cheap. Let's cut to the heart of where that statement comes from. When people make that statement, what are they assuming about book value? It's more than that. They're actually making something even more concrete that it is. It's accurate and it's a good measure of liquidation value. In many people's mind, book value is what they think liquidation value is. And you can see then the logic, right? If I can liquidate a company and make 100, it's trading at less than 100, it must be cheap. And already you can see the danger of that. Book value might not be liquidation value because who knows what goes into book value. But that's the basis for the price to book fixation. So let's take price to book apart. No? So next, so I'll play the role. I call you and say, you have a, the stock looks incredible bargain. It's trading at a third of book value. Let's see what variables drive the price to book ratio. It's an equity multiple. So I went back to an equity valuation model, a dividend discount model. I divide both sides by the book value. I have an equation for price to book. And price to book ratio for a company is return in equity times payout ratio times one plus. So basically, there seem to be four variables. But you can actually make them into three in a moment, and I'll show you why. But basically, I've taken the dividend discount model and extracted what the variables are that drive price to book. So it's return equity payout ratio, cost of equity, and growth rate. But do you remember when we did the fundamental growth equation way back in time? What is the fundamental growth in our equity earnings for a company? What do we write it out as? We wrote it as one minus the payout ratio times return, return in equity. Remember the return, if it brings back bad memories? It's because it was the first problem and the second quiz. Is, oh my God, if I'd just seen that equation then. There, it's the retention ratio times return equity. I plug it back into the previous page table. I get this magical transformation that makes the price to book ratio for a mature company an even simpler equation. The price to book ratio for a company is the return in equity minus the growth rate in the numerator. If you don't believe me, plug, it, plug back this, this growth equation to the previous page, divided by cost of equity minus the growth rate. So take a look at that equation. What kinds of stocks will trade at below book value? There are only two variables that you the return equity and cost of equity, right? So if your return, if you expect a company to deliver a return equity less than its cost of equity in post, I mean for the rest of you think, what kind of I think Deutsche Bank. Right? Even in my best case scenario, 10 years from now they catch up with cost of equity. They never get it. I would expect Deutsche Bank <coughs> to trade at a significant discount in book value, and it does. You can buy Deutsche for 40 cents on the dollar, 0.4 book price to book. Why? Because you expect its return equity be lower than the cost of equity. Conversely, if I give you Adobe, you can talk about all the mechanics of book, its return equity is like 83%. We can say it's overstated, but let's say it's 43%. You'd expect Adobe to trade at a huge multiple of book value. It's a very simple mechanism, again, to take apart these arguments that people make. Stocks are undervalued, overvalued. Okay. Now, if I switch to an enterprise value multiple, and just to show you the parallels here, price to book is an equity multiple. Market value of equity divided book value of equity. In an enterprise value to invested capital multiple, I'm just shifting everything to an enterprise. So in the numerator now, I have market value of equity plus debt minus cash. And the denominator, book value. So basically, it's like a price to book ratio for the entire firm. To see what drives the enterprise value to invested capital, I go to an enterprise value model. I work through the algebra and take a look at the bottom of that page. You have the drivers of an enterprise value. Does that look familiar? When I did price to book, it was return in equity minus co and cost of equity. It's return in capital versus cost of capital. What kinds of companies will trade at below invested capital? Companies are expect the return invested capital to be less than the cost of capital. If you earn roughly your cost of capital, your enterprise value is going to be roughly your... Now do you see why I made that fixation of keep... Remember as I was doing my DCFs, I kept track of your invested capital by adding your reinvestment? Because I know this is waiting for me out there as a decision I have to make. And you can see the linkage. So by now, do you get 
the mechanics. I give you a multiple. What's the first thing you do? Before you use it, do the algebra. Equity multiple, go back and use a dividend discount model, firm multiple, doing firm model. You will get the variables that drive that multiple. While we're on this, might as well deal with EV to EBITDA. I told you when I introduced EV to EBITDA that this was the fastest growing multiple in use in equity research. Right? 35 years ago, very few people used EV to EBITDA. Today, not a third of all equity research is driven by it. There are good reasons and bad reasons for why it's being used. What are some of the good reasons why people have shifted away from PE ratios to EV to EBITDA? One is that it's a cash flow measure as opposed to an earnings measure, so that's one. What else? So why don't I, I could have done a cash, equity cash earnings as well, right? I had the appreciation amortization back to net income. I, so why the moving up the income statement? Second is you don't trust accountants as much. The further down an income statement you go, the more you get. It's not just how they account for equity earnings, but remember all those cross holdings and other crap that happens below. You say, I don't want to deal with that. Okay, so that's the second. What else? As leverage varies across companies within a sector, price earnings ratios are going to be impacted. Think of why. What's one of the variables that drives price earnings ratio? Your cost of equity, right? So as my borrowing increases, my beta should go up. My so if you have a sector where you have some companies with no debt and some companies with 80% debt, it becomes more and more difficult to compare any equity multiple. So the third reason is because of differences in leverage. Because 30 years ago, sectors had very similar debt ratios. Now you've got variations. The third reason is it's not quite leverage-free as some promoters, but it does make you less affected by leverage. So those are the good reasons. What's the bad reason? You can sell some real dogs using enterprise value to EBITDA multiples. You know why? We have no frame of reference. When I ask you to pay 50 times earnings, you say, that's high. Why do we say it's high? Because at least we have a sense, because you read the newspaper, you know, 20 times earnings, eight, and 50 is high. When I ask you to pay 10 times EBITDA, very few of us have a frame of reference. I know what the median EV, do you know what the median EV to EBITDA is for the market? Does anybody, if, if, you, if you can tell me what the median is, don't look at your notes, it's actually in there. I was going to say an A, no, but I, I can't give you an A if you can look it up in your notes. It's higher than seven. It's more like ten and a half, I think, you know, somewhere around that right now. Um, but the thing is, very few of us. In fact, when 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 I run into analysts who use EV debit Dow all the time, I ask them, "What's the medium for the market?" They have no idea. Which means, when you're trying to sell something on EV debit Dow, it looks slow. Six times debit Dow looks slow. Why? Because what's the only earnings multiple that we have a frame of reference on? We know we shouldn't be doing this, but we're comparing the 6 to 15. That looks slow. I'll buy it. So I decided to break down EBITDA. EBITDA. And to do this, I'm going to do something kind of messy up front. That's a standard enterprise value equation. Free cash flow to the firm divided by cost of capital minus the growth rate. I took the free cash flow to the firm, and I wrote it in terms of EBITDA. That's not how we usually do it. We usually write EBIT times 1 minus T plus depreciation. So I, I promise I've not messed the equation up. I've just brought EBITDA in because I want it on the right-hand side of the equation. So that's just the standard free cash flow the firm equation written in terms of EBITDA. I divide both sides of the equation by EBITDA. <coughs> I now have the variables that drive the EV to EBITDA for a company. And as I go through them, I want you to th start thinking screen. So you're going to go to Capital IQ. You're going to look for cheap stocks based on EV to EBITDA. As I list each variable, start thinking about the screen you run. First, I want companies with low tax rates. You're saying, when we did PE ratios, we never cared about tax rates. Why do we care about tax rates when we do EBITDA? Why do we care about tax rates? Because net income is already after taxes. So I don't know. So if you paid a high tax rate, it's already in your net income. But EBITDA is before taxes. Let me take an extreme circumstance. Let's suppose you live in a market where the tax rate is 100%. Nobody mentioned this to you. They have a nice EBITDA. You say, OK, I'm paying for your EBITDA. And then they, the government comes and takes all your money away. You just overpaid, right? You're saying, that is absurd. My next. I said this week is going to be my last intrinsic valuation. Next week, I want to do a pricing of Aramco. You know the problem with Aramco is? The tax rate 
is undefined. Because right now, what does the Saudi government do? It comes in and takes whatever money it needs, because that's how you balance the Saudi budget. Is two-thirds of the Saudi budget comes from Aramco income. So when Aramco first started talking about doing an IPO, and they said, look, we have great oil reserves. Everybody said, of course you do. And they said, it costs us only $7 a barrel to get the oil. Everybody else pays that. Of course, that's true. And they said, you should be paying a high price. People said, OK, that's good, but you have to specify, because right now there's no tax rate given. What percentage of the income will the Saudi government take? And the Saudi government said, well, we'll take it public, and then we'll tell you. <laughs> that didn't go over very well, because are you going to take away 65% or 25%? That makes a huge difference. And the reason the Saudi government can't give a number is that number now will tell you whether their budget is balanced or not. So it's, uh, it's almost like they can't give you the number without creating all kinds of budget problems along the way. But when you do EBITDA, you want companies with, so if you're thinking screens, you want low EV to EBITDA, but if you have a high tax rate, that's a problem. Cost of capital, high cost of capital, lower EV to EBITDA. So it kind of makes sense, riskier companies. Higher growth rate, higher EV to EBITDA. So, so far, the multiples look like P ratios. Now comes this interesting three items here. Depreciation, CapEx. If you net those three items out, what you get is CapEx minus depreciation plus change in working capital. Does that sound familiar? What is CapEx? That's your reinvestment. Companies that have to reinvest a lot to get the same growth rate will trade at a lower EV to EBITDA than companies that can get that same growth rate with less reinvestment. So let's do the screens. You want a company with low EV to EBITDA. Low tax rate or high tax rate? You want low effective tax rate because if you're paying an 85% effective tax rate, I can understand why you're trading. Okay? You want high growth, you want low cost of capital, and you want a low reinvestment rate to go with that growth rate. Basically, you want that growth to come at the low reinvestment. You've got the screens you need for a cheap stock. Now do you see why most stocks that trade at four or five times EBITDA are really not cheap? They just deserve to be cheap. They're in horrible businesses where your margins are imploding. You have huge amounts of risk. And you have huge reinvestment needs. You're capital intensive. Of course, you're going to trade at three to four times EBITDA. So I take, I'm going to take a hypothetical firm. I took a firm, a tax rate was given, capex and depreciation are also given, cost of capital is 10%. For simplicity, let's assume no working capital requirements because that will keep my equation a little simpler. It's in stable growth growing 5% a year. Plugging numbers into that previous page, I get 8.24 as my intrinsic EV to EBITDA for the company. This company should trade at 8.24 times EBITDA. Remember those variables I talked about? I did what if? As the tax rate goes up, look at what happens to my EV debit dive. My tax rate was 0%. This same company that I just computed the EV debit dive should have an EV debit dive 14. As the tax rate goes up, the EV debit dive goes down. When you compare airlines, Ryanair always looks cheapest on an EV debit dive basis. That's because their tax rate is only 12.5%. So control for difference in tax rates. Second, the more reinvestment I have for any given growth rate, the lower my EV to EBITDA is going to be because I'm working harder to deliver the same growth rate. And third, I took the return on capital and cost of capital and consolidated. It's an excess return, right? And the larger my excess returns, the higher my EV to EBITDA. None of this is surprising. What is surprising is analysts who just are lazy enough that they take, they never ask the questions. It's not as if any of these numbers are difficult to get is that they don't want to ask the question. EV to sales. So by now you know, the. so I'm not going to go through the mechanics. I took an EV, I divide both sides, and I have the variables that drive EV to sales. There, after-tax operating margin. Every time I introduce a multiple, there's a variable that pops up with that multiple. Price to book is return on equity. With the EV to invested capital is return on capital. EV to sales, it's after-tax operating margin. I call these variables companion variables. What I mean by that is if you try to sell me a stock based on a multiple, my first question is always about the companion variable. So if you say a stock is cheap because its P-E ratio is low, so what's the growth rate? Growth is the companion for P-E. If you tell me a stock is cheap because its price to book is 0.5, my first question is what's your return equity? And if you tell me a stock is cheap because it trades at a low multiple of sales, you know what my question is going to be, right? What kind of margins do you have as a business? Kroger has a really low EV to sales ratio. You know why? It's operating margins of that, uh, that of a grocery store. It's 2 to 3%. In contrast, 
If I gave you Royal Florent, it's going to trade at a high EV to sales ratio because it's a brand name company, a premium pricing, a much higher margin. So you see the variables. And again, the, the equations don't get too caught up in the equation. They look messy and complicated. But this is VCF margin. The only reason I use them, I'm sorry, I mean to throw it at you. The only reason I use them is they tell me what I need to control for. And that is critical when I do pricing. So now I'm going to take a little side tangent. And I'm going to use what I talked about in the context of EV to sales to answer a question that has been bugging me for a while. In your marketing class, they make this big deal about brand names. Marketing people love to talk about brand names, but they can never put a number on it. Because I know it when I see it, after the fact. So let's think about what the value of a brand name is. And I kind of talked about this at the start of the class, but let me revisit it. To me, the power of a brand name comes from the fact that you can charge a higher price for exactly the same product. I gave you the example of aspirin. Welcome to the CVS. There's bare aspirin. There's generic aspirin. It's exactly the same product. But look at the prices. Take Sudafed, imitation Sudafed. Pure brand name power, right? So if you have a brand name, it's going to show up as a much higher margin. So if you ask me to value a brand name, what do I need to do? I need to value how much pricing power you got because of the brand name. That difference is going to show up as a difference in multiples of revenues. A high brand name company would trade at a high, much higher multiple. Yeah. So I'm going to try this out. About a decade ago, probably even more than that, 15 years ago, a student of mine who's pretty high up in the ranks in Coca-Cola called me and he said, can you come in and talk to our top management team about Coca-Cola's brand name? This is like you know, offering crack cocaine because that's all they think about, brand name, brand name, brand name. You know, that's it. They're fixated on it. So I walk in, you've got everybody in the top management team. And I do a, an intrinsic value. So they said, we'd like you to value. So I valued Coca-Cola. I come up with a value of about $80 billion. I finished the valuation. Guy in the front row, head marketing honcho, puts up his hand. And he says, you forgot something very important. I said, what did I forget? A whole division maybe, maybe a geography. I said, what did I forget? He said, you've forgotten the fact that Coca-Cola is the most valuable brand name in the world. I said, what exactly do you want me to do? He said, you should be adding a 20% premium to that 79.6 billion. And I said, why 20%? He said, because that's what we do at Coca-Cola, is when we buy brand name companies in other countries, we value them, and then we add 20%. And I said, just because you do stupid things doesn't mean I have to do stupid things too. He said, don't you think our brand name is worth a lot? I said, it's the only thing in this entire building that's worth something. You think the taste matters? Now, I was leaving 20 minutes later anyway. What do I care whether they, no. it's not like they're going to turn off my Coke supply for the rest of, I don't even like Coca-Cola. I like prefer, I don't even like Pepsi either, so I can't even say that. I should have walked in with a Pepsi can just to show them. Right? <laughs> he said, no, I said, it's, it's in there. He said, where? Everywhere. He said, why do you think you have 15.57% margins? You think it's because of the taste? No, it's because of your brand name. You think you're growing because you're a great company? No, it's because you have a brand name. I said, it's in there. And he said, I don't believe you. This is what marketing people do. And I came prepared. I knew this question was coming, and I came prepared, and I got incredibly lucky. I said, let's play a game. Let's suppose tomorrow we wake up with selective amnesia, the entire globe, and the only thing we don't recognize is the red can and the word Coca-Cola. This is every marketing person's nightmare. Let's make it come true. So what's going to happen? Tomorrow you wake up, your brand name's gone. You're a generic soda company, right? And this is where I got lucky. I found a company called Cot, C-O-T-T. It's a Canadian company. It sells almost as many cans of soda as Coca-Cola does. But you've never drunk a Cot soda, right? You know what they do? They sell their generic sodas to grocery stores to stamp with their own name. So you go Grand Union, Pathmark, they're a generic soda company. I said, tomorrow, if your brand name goes away, you become a generic soda company. You become a generic soda company, your margins are going to crumble, because that's what COTS margins are. I'm going to revalue you with COTS margins, and it's going to have ripple effects, because that low margin of 5.28% is going to translate into a return on capital of about 7%, not the sky-high 20% you have now. That low return on capital is going to translate into low growth, and you work it all the way through, the value that I get for your company with the brand name gone is about 15 billion. You want me to add a brand name premium? 
I just gave you one, 64 billion. That's the difference between the two numbers. You want me to add 20%? Tell me why. I can't just add it because it's already in there. This is my perspective on discounted cash flow valuation. I'm, I don't know whether you've ever seen this ad. It's probably somewhere in, on Google. You can look it up in YouTube. This old ad for a spaghetti sauce called ragu spaghetti sauce. And this, here's how the ad begins. There's this 40-year-old Italian man who walks into his mother's house, and it's clearly that he's, he must be a big-time loser because it seems like he shows up at his mother's house for dinner every night. So she's in the kitchen making dinner. She's making spaghetti sauce. And the, the, in the ad, she's surrounded by empty bottles of ragu spaghetti sauce. And he says, Mom, what are you doing? She says, I'm making spaghetti sauce. And she says, you're making them from bottles? This is an old Italian woman, no old-time old recipe she brought down from Sicily. No. She says, you're making it out of a bottle? And she should have said, if you didn't show up every day for dinner, I would make it from scratch. But you're showing up every day. I have to make it from a bottle. But that's not what she says. She says, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's good spaghetti sauce. And then he starts listing off the ingredients. I'm not that good with spaghetti sauce. If the ingredients don't fit, just leave them up. So where's the tomatoes? It's in there. Where's the oregano? It's in there. Where's the cayenne? I'm Indian. I throw cayenne into everything. It's in there. So... <laughs> As in, so as with, every, with every ingredient, say, it's in there, it's in there, it's in there. In discounted cash flow evaluation, if you've done your job right, when people start asking you, where's that? It's in there. Where's the brand name? It's in there. Where's the good man? It's in there. There's no sprinkling, garnishing, uh, other stuff on top, because it should already be in there. That is the key to good valuation. There's no after-the-fact storytelling. It should be already in there. So think about doing this. This is my compressed page for all of the multiples you're going to run into. And if you think about it, it's basically I start with the same basic equation in every multiple and I work down to the variables. And that is why we do this. And I want to emphasize this. When you do the pricing for your company, I don't want you to go plug numbers into those equations and come up with a pricing based on the equations you saw because what you're going to get is really a two-stage dividend discount model valuation of your company. You've already finished your DCF. This is about pricing, and the entire focus of why we're doing this is to think about what variables we need to control for when we price for your companies. Okay. Define, describe, analyze. Now we're ready to apply. And when we apply, here are the questions we're going to ask. What is a comparable firm? And if you ask any equity research analyst, the answer you get is, what are you asking, talking about? If it's a steel company, it's other steel companies. If it's utilities, it's other utilities. If it's Lyft... It's Uber. It's Uber. It's Lyft. Lyft. It's Uber. Uber. Lyft. So basically, you go back and maybe DD will enter the picture. And Uber, Lyft, and DD, right? But the basis there is comparable companies must be companies that are in the same sector, the same business. But let me challenge that notion. When we did discounted cash flow evaluation, when we did, we said, what did, what did we say? The value of a company comes from its cash flows, growth, and risk. If you have two companies, a tech company and utility, that have say this, the similar cash flows, growth, and risk, guess what? They should have the same value. So let me redefine what I think should be comparable companies. There should be other companies with similar cash flows, similar growth, and similar risk. I don't want to compare Microsoft to any other software company. It's not even remotely comparable. Maybe I want to compare it to other companies that dominate their sectors, a big cash cows. And who knows, Coca-Cola might be more comparable to Microsoft than any other software company. So we're going to kind of push at that notion of comparable. And second is no matter how careful you are about defining your comparables, you will still have differences across companies that you have to control for. And that control for cannot just be storytelling, because as you can see, storytelling is not going to let you make a judgment. So here are some of the choices you will have to make when you do pricing. So think of this as a template for the rest of your project. It's actually much less involved than your DCF, so get it done as soon as you can. So when you look at pricing your stock, the first thing you have to decide is whether you want to define comp comparable narrowly or broadly. And here's what the trade-off is. If you define it narrowly and say, look, I want companies that are in the same business, in the same geography, with roughly the same market cap. Think of this as capital IQ. You're screening for that you're going to get a much smaller sample of companies like you. Which is good, right? Because you don't have to control for as many differences. But if you define it more broadly, I'm going to look at you know, all steel companies globally, you're going to get a much larger sample with bigger differences. So the first question you've got to decide is, do I want to go for a small sample of like companies, 
or a much larger sample of companies with bigger differences. I'll give you my price because I don't think there's a clean answer in this one. If you're doing storytelling, then keep it small and narrow because you can't control for too many things in stories. But if you're willing to bring in statistical tools, the law of large numbers will always lead you towards a larger sample because you can control for those differences using regressions or statistics or whatever you need to do. But the choice you will have to make. Am I going to go small or am I going to large and terminal? Second, when you talk about controlling for differences, here are the choices. The first is direct comparisons. This works best only if you have companies that are almost identical. For the longest time, you know how equity research analysts valued Ford? For almost a century. By comparing it to GM and Chrysler. You know how they valued GM? By comparing Ford and Chrysler. How they valued Chrysler? By looking at, you kind of get it, the three companies. And the rationale worked for a long time because the three companies were so, were similar that you could just do the direct comparison. So you could say Ford looks cheap because its PE ratio is lower than GM and that was the end of the process. The second is storytelling, where there are differences, but you tell me a story. This company has a higher P-E ratio, but you know what? It's got higher margins or higher growth or lower risk. The problem with storytelling is I'm not sure where it leads you. You can tell me why a company should have a higher P-E ratio, but you can't tell me how much higher. The third is you try to modify the multiple to bring in whatever you're worried about. Peg ratio is a classic example. You say growth affects P-E, I'm just going to bring it into the multiple. And the fourth is to use statistics. 30 years ago, you couldn't have. You didn't have the data. You couldn't put it in a spreadsheet. It was too messy. Today, we have that fourth choice almost every time we do pricing. So as with my, my, my macro piece, I'm going to play the role of an equity research analyst. And I'm going to make some buy recommendations on stocks. And I'd like you to shoot me down. So I'm the beverage analyst. I'm getting fired job after job because I'm doing these crappy recommendations. Now I'm the beverage analyst. And I put out two recommendations. I want you to buy Todd Hunter and Andre's wine. You know Andre's wine? This is a champagne that's so cheap that you get a headache watching that commercial. It's only before Christmas. It's a guy in a sleigh. He's drinking Andre wine. It looks like he's going to pass out at any moment. Okay. So it's a really cheap wine. So Hansen, of course, is the natural soda company. Why do I like them? I'm a very simplistic analyst. You see why I latched onto them? They have the lowest P-E ratios. So I tell you to buy Andre Wine and Hanson Natural because they have the lowest P-E ratios. So I'm going to turn back to the previous page, and I'd like you to tell me why I might have screwed up. I've actually given away the answer as part of this, the table. What do you see for Andre Wine? And they have the lowest P-E, but they also have the lowest growth rate. And I could try to tell you a story, but both Hanson and Andre Wine were... I'm sorry, Andre Wine had a low growth rate. Hansen actually looks good, so we'll hold off on Hansen. Andre Wine and Todd Hunter have really low growth rates. Hansen Wine looks intriguing. It has low PE and a high growth rate. Hold on to that thought because I'm not ready. It takes care of the growth rate. What have I not controlled for? I still haven't controlled for risk, so maybe that's a factor. The last column, I give you the risk. Hansen looks okay on growth, but it's the riskiest stock in the sector. So with Todd Hunter and Andre Wine, the problem is low growth. With Hansen, the problem is really high risk. You say, what do I do? It's storytelling. There's nothing you're going to be able to do because you're going to talk yourself into a corner. You say, on the one hand, it's low PE. On the other hand, it has high risk. On the one hand, it's low PE. And, you know. Do you think we could do something with the data? We have lots of data here. And one of the things you're going to see me do is I'm going to run a regression of PE ratios against growth and risk. We'll see what that looks like. But at least for the storytelling, you can see how quickly the storytelling runs out of, you know. Let me try a second. So I get fired as a beverage analyst. After I put out the Andre Wine, Todd Hunter, and Hanson, somebody looked and said, you're a terrible analyst, you're fired. I land on my feet. I'm now the telecom analyst. I switch from sector to sector. I bring nothing to each sector, but it doesn't seem to matter. So I take, these are ADRs of telecoms that went, well, remember prior to the 1990s, outside the US, almost every telecom company was a government-owned company. So in the 80s and 90s, they were all privatized, so the ADRs get listed. So here again, I'm going to do what a simplistic analyst would do, which is to tell you to buy Petrobras, I'm sorry, Telebras, 
and Intosat. Telepress, of course, then was the monopoly that was the Brazil. It's since been broken up into seven telecom companies. And Intosat was the Indonesian satellite company. Remember, this is late 90s when emerging markets are actually emerging markets and developed markets are developed markets. So again, they could be cheap. They have really low PE ratios, but give me the caveats. First is the growth rate for those two companies is lower than the growth rate for the rest of the sector. What's the second thing that worries you? The risk, right? These are two emerging market telecom companies, and there are other telecom companies that are from developed markets, like I think the Danish telecom company, say, hey, you know what? The P ratio looks low, but the growth is awful and the risk is high. <coughs> Again, storytelling can get you only so far. So here's what I did. I said, okay, I'm sick of stories. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the PE ratios for these companies and regress them against two variables. The first is the growth rate, because we talked about why growth matters. The second is a dummy variable. Do you remember dummy variables in statistics? You put zero or one. I put zero for every developed market telecom and one for every emerging market telecom. Let's read the output. First, the constant, the intercept is 13.12. What does that tell me? It tells me the base from which I'm going to build off for the sector. Every 1% increase in my growth rate increases my PE ratio by 1.21. So if your growth rate is 5% higher than mine, I'd expect your PE ratio to be about 6 higher than mine. And look at the coefficient on the emerging market dummy, minus 13.85. How would I read that? I have two telecom companies with the same growth rate in the late 90s. One is developed and the other is emerging market. The emerging market telecom company will have a PE ratio 13.85 lower. That's an astonishing discount. This is the pricing analog to how we deal with country risk, right? In this intrinsic valuation, we bring, here we let the market tell us, hey, you're worried about emerging markets, tell me how much you're worried, because it shows up as that reduction. Now, why did I do this? Because I thought Indosat and Telebras look cheap, right? Now, how do I answer that question? I go in and plug in the growth rate, for instance, in Telebras. 7.5% growth rate. Plug in the fact it's an emerging market telecom company. I get a predicted PE of 8.35. At its actual PE of 8.9, it looks like Terabras is actually overvalued, not undervalued, once I control for growth and risk. I'm not suggesting regressions are magical tools, but they should be in your toolbox because regressions were designed exactly for problems like this. We have large amounts of data pulling in opposite directions regressions try to make. In fact, I wish statistics classes were taught with financial data rather than the kind of nonsensical stuff that they put in there about you know, eating and weight and GPAs and beers and all kinds of stuff. You say, what? You don't you kind of find something realistic that I might actually run into in the rest of my life? I know if I eat a lot, I'm going to weigh a lot. I know if I drink a lot, my GPA is going to hit the toilet. I don't need you confirming this by running regressions and telling me this. I think it will actually make it fun to actually do this because you could actually make money off your statistics project. It won't be just a project you take in because maybe you can build that regression that actually tells you how steel companies should be priced. Okay. One final exercise, and then I have to run because I have to catch a 508 out of Penn Station. I have to get to New York Airport. I have a 7 o'clock flight to London, so I can't miss that. So that's one final example. So here I have price-to-book ratios for European companies. So you've got the f second third column, you've got the price-to-book ratios, ranging from Bayer, Rishi, Hippo, that's some German you know, commercial. Com so basically, you can see price-to-book ratios. Returns and equity in the second column, standard deviation of the stock price in the third column. Okay? So you've got price-to-book. I'm going to initially do an eyeballing process, and it's a very simplistic process. I want stocks with low price-to-book, high return in equity, and low risk, right? So here's a very simplistic way to do this. I computed the median for each of these numbers. What is the median price to book? Median return equity, median standard deviation. And then I look for stocks rated at less than the pri median price to book ratio while having returns in equity higher. In fact, the stock that I think showed up was, you know, if, if you look at 2.07, I'm looking at a stock that has, I think, Paraba, trades at a price to book less than the sector, has a return in equity higher than the sector, I uh, know oh it's, it's riskier, so that doesn't work. You find any cheap stocks there? 11.82. Hmm, maybe I can't find any cheap stocks. Maybe. Yeah. Do you see what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to find price to book less than 2.07, return on equity higher than 12 point something percent, and a standard deviation less than 
I'm sorry, lower than 21.93 percent. I'm going to let you look for it. But that's, you can see the problem with eyeballing, and this is with 25 companies. Can you imagine giving you 250 companies? You're sitting there, what's the eyeballing look like? Your eyes are going to roll, um, eyeballs are going to roll out of your head. So this is exactly, again, why I go to statistics. Because I can sit there looking for companies. And that's, unfortunately, how equity research analysts do this. They eyeball the data. Say, oh, that looks cheap. I'm glad you found it. Now, what kind of you know, instincts do you have? Maybe you're some kind of genius in figuring things out. I can't do it. Once you get past 20 or 25 companies, eyeballing the data becomes really difficult. So here's, here's what I did. I took the data. And by now, you can see what I do, right? Basically, I'm trying to explain price to book. I threw in return equity and standard deviation. I get a pretty good R squared. High return equity companies have higher price to book ratios. And with financial service companies, price to book and return equity work incredibly well because book value actually means something. Okay? And the regressions R squared is 79%. So I actually took every one of my banks and I plugged in that their numbers into a, and I get a predicted price to book based on their fundamentals. And in the last column, I've actually compared their actual price to book to my predicted price to book. So what's my cheapest stock? Well, if you look at the percentage numbers, Royal Bank of Scotland has minus 16. You want a big negative number, right? You want it to be undervalued. Looks like it's the cheapest stock. What's the most expensive stock? It looks like Erste Bank, which is an East European bank. You know, it's over, overpriced by 23%. Again, I'm not suggesting that regressions replace analysts, but you can see, again, using this tool allows you to kind of look, bring in all the data. So I'm going to ask you to get started on your pricing. I know it looks like I'm piling on, and I am, but the, the time is, I mean, you're going to see things start to crunch up, especially if you have any time this weekend Go to Capital IQ, download the data. It'll take you all of an hour or two if you're, w if you're willing to spend some focus time. The pricing part of the process is just downloading the data and just looking at the numbers. You have to pick a multiple. So you'd have to make those choices. But try to do the best job you can pricing because that's the next phase of your project. I will see you. I've never finished a class before, t before 445. Today I'm going to give you three extra minutes so you can get to your pricing right away. Okay? So I will see you on Monday.